Good morning and welcome to the Medically Intensive Children's Program, known as MIC, and the Private Duty Nursing, known as PDN, webinar. This is a webinar presented to you today through collaboration of the Washington State Healthcare Authority and the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services, represented by staff from the Developmental Disabilities Administration. I am Gail Kreger and I am the manager for the Medicaid Compliance Review and Analytics section of the Healthcare Authority. I am joined today by Nancy Height, my colleague who is an occupational nurse consultant with the Clinical Quality Care and Transformation Division of the Healthcare Authority. Nancy and I are joined today by, with, by Doris Barrett, the MICP Program Manager for the Developmental Disabilities Administration of DSHS. Thank you for attending today. Hard copies of this webinar will be available to those who have registered to attend. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Why are we here? Litigation was filed in September of 2015 on behalf of five children receiving MICP services. One child was covered by fee-for-service and four others were enrolled in one of the Apple Health Medicaid managed care plans. The lawsuit claimed that the state was violating federal Medicaid law and the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as ADA. Plaintiffs didn't believe that HCA was fulfilling its role and responsibilities to assure that children were receiving the authorized hours of skilled nursing care or doing enough to assure that the Developmental Disabilities Administration and the managed care plans were actively engaged in discharge planning to assure provisions of services in the least restrictive setting. A settlement was signed in December of 2016 with the Healthcare Authority and Northwest Justice Project. The provisions of the settlement were aimed at improving the current program. We are currently implementing the provisions of that settlement. For the children on whose behalf the litigation action was taken only, HCA and DDA agreed to continue to arrange services as needed and allow the families to use unused nursing hours outside of current WAC stipulations. Other provisions of this settlement that HCA and DDA agreed to are to assure this benefit meets the requirements of early and periodic screening, diagnostic, and treatment, otherwise known as EPSDT. Measures we have taken to achieve this objective are the production of a MIC informational mailer to educate current and prospective families about the benefit. This includes a description of the responsibilities of the Healthcare Authority, DDA, and the managed care organizations, and who to contact at HCA if families or guardians are unable to fill authorized hours. These letters are being distributed now. Secondly, we have a mandatory training, which is what we're attending today, to all state agencies and, and managed care staff who need to know. Those who were invited to the training today include case managers, nursing care consultants, complex case managers, social workers, program managers, utilization review staff, and customer service staff. This training is available today and will be available through the month of April for future for those who could not attend today. In addition, HCA will assure the DDA and the managed care plans arrange for medically necessary services and there is a process for resolution of complaints about unavailability of nurses to fill authorized MICP hours. Steps taken to achieve this include updating the memorandum of understanding between DSHS and HCA to be consistent with the provisions of this settlement. This formalizes um, the roles and responsibilities each of us have towards providing this service and how the two of us will work together. In addition, HCA will provide adequate oversight of the plans regarding the delivery of these services, including monitoring for underutilization and hours not filled, and exploring single case rate agreements when indicated to access nursing. Lastly, we promised to, we assured them a re resolution for institutionalized en enrollees, and HCA is committed to work with DDA and the managed care plans to establish policies and procedures for facilitating discharge when MICP 
services are needed, but nurses are not available. Consequently, to establish and policies and procedures, we will uh, provide an additional training on these new policies, and that will be coming later this spring or summer. So let's talk about getting rid of the myths and understanding the facts about the MIC benefit. The lawsuit brought to light situations where our communication was, for lack of better words, jumbled and confusing. It's important that those of us who have contact with families, guardians, and providers speak with one voice and deliver one message. We hope this webinar is educational for you and it will help us achieve that goal. So one of the things we tried to do with the, the three of us working together to move forward on this is we want to clear up the confusion that may be caused by semantics or the use of labor. Medicaid's private duty nursing program for 17 years and under is a state plan amendment service for Medicaid. In the fee-for-service program, clients receive program under DDA. HCA is the single Medicaid agency for Washington has delegated the administration of this benefit to DDA of DSHS. HCA and DDA partner in the delivery of this benefit. Then we have the children who are enrolled in managed care plans. These children, again, receive this service that has been delegated to them by, through the managed care plans that has been delegated to them by HCA. The organizations, the managed care plans have um, this cost included in their rate. The benefit for both programs will now be called Medically Intensive Children's Program. So there will be no longer a reference to PDN for 17 and under as it applies to the plan. We'll use one term so that everyone knows it's a benefit of equal value. Let's also clear up another myth. MIC is not home health. Home health is a different benefit. The MIC benefit is a state plan approved private duty nursing service for qualified children who are 17 of eight years of age and younger. They receive their services through a Medicare certified PDN agency. The services they receive are delivered by skilled nurses that are either RNs or LPNs only. And the care qualification is that you must need at least four hours a day of that level of care. Whereas in the home health benefit, it is true still that the state plan has approved a home health services with no age restrictions. It's a Medicare certified home health agency that is rendering the service. The services rendered under a home health benefit are skilled nursing visits from an RN or an LPN, but it also includes physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a home health aid service. The care under the home health benefit is intermittent and short term. Nursing visits may last from approximately 20 minutes to an hour and an hour and a half, depending on the services being rendered. That is the difference between the two benefits, and we thought it was important to make sure everyone understood that. Nancy? Okay. Um, healthcare authority has responsibilities. We are the single state agency that ultimately is responsible for the program. We must assure the DDA and Apple Health Managed Care Plans are fulfilling the responsibilities delegated to them and providing the medical necessary uh, authorized services. We contact it provides contact resources to help families who may be experiencing difficulty obtaining the mixed services, assure children and Apple Health get the nursing services they need, and assure services are being provided in the least restrictive uh, manner. Um, what is mixed? Intensively, intensively children, medically intensive children's program provides skilled nursing services to children with complex medical needs 17 years of age and younger provides these services in a family home, a foster home, or a contractedly medically intensive children's group home, and staffed by residential homes in a lieu of hospitalization. This program helps to keep families together and in the least restrictive setting. There is approximately 200 children that are supported in any given time through the MIC program, either through fee-for-service or managed care. Criteria for the MIC program, they must be enrolled in Washington Apple Health Medicaid. 
child have, if the child has private medical insurance coverage, the parent or legal representative must seek private duty nursing under the insurance policy first. Then have must have prior authorization from the DDA program manager, which is DORS, or the child's managed care plan as applicable. Home plan of care must be safe for the child and agreed to by the parent or the legal guardian. Services are rendered under WAP 182-551-3000. The clinical criteria for MIC, the child requires far or more hours of continuous skilled nursing services, has a complex need, medical need not within the scope of intermittent home health services, and the services can be safe, safely provided in a community setting, private home, or group home setting. We have Doris Barrett here, who is our MIC uh, program manager, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Good day. So what are BDA's responsibility in the management of this program? We are the administrators of the MIC program for HCA. We determine the clinical and financial eligibility of children covered by the fee-for-service program for DDA services. We meet with the family and assess the child to determine medical necessity of skilled nursing services, including the specific number of hours that are needed or required. We arrange medically necessary services to assure timely access. This is done through the DDA program manager. We also send a written letter called a Planned Action Notice, or PAN, telling parents or guardians or their authorized representative the number of hours approved or changed uh, of those hours that have been approved. So let's talk about the process. It is a two-part process. We have a financial eligibility and clinical eligibility to make them eligible for, for MIT. So let's first review the financial eligibility. Our intake and eligibility staff review the application and make eligibility determination. The child must be eligible for Washington Apple Health under categorically needy or med medically needy scope, <coughs> scope of care. Then I, the DDA program manager at headquarters, check, will check provider one to confirm Apple Health eligibility. If this client is a managed care enrollee, I will then, as DBA program manager, notify the hospital. So that's the financial piece. We then go to the clinical criteria, or the clinical eligibility. Or D the DDA nursing care consultant will do an assessment of the needs and make recommendations to me as a program manager for services. Then as a program manager, I review the information submitted. That information submitted is a MIC application, is a MIC application packet, and I also review the NCC's recommendation. As a VDA program manager, I make the final decision, which may include consultation with the Healthcare Authority, HCA, Utilization Review Team. Once this has been decided, I then report the authorized hours. So what is in that DDA MIC application packet? It consists of, first off, our form, DSHS form 14-012, which is a consent form. The second component is DSHS 14-151, which we request for DDA eligibility determination. Also is DSHS form 03, 387, Notice of Privacy Practice for Client Information, and finally, DSHS Form 15-398, which is the actual MICP application. Now, the hospital, family, or other community resources must complete these forms. They are then submitted to the Medically Intensive Children Program at this email address. Email address is MICP at VSHS.WA.GOV. I've also included here for your review a list of contacts per region for, for DDA. 
Now I'm going to turn it back to Gail to talk about managed care responsibilities. So as we said earlier, children receive services under the Fee for Service Program. The children can receive services if they are covered by a managed care plan. The managed care plan's responsibilities are that they'll follow the same WAC that Doris does, WAC 182-551-3000. They will apply, they can apply a broader criteria if it is in lieu of some services. For example, continued inpatient hospitalization, that doesn't necessarily meet the big criteria, but could be rendered in the home, um, such as, let's say, long-term IV therapy. They can also, the managed care plans will also engage with hospital staff to facilitate timely discharge. They'll engage with the family in planning and in um, that discharge. They will authorize medically necessary hours. They will arrange for services in a timely manner, manner excuse me, and assure hours are fulfilled. They will identify other needs for the child or the family and assist or intervene as indicated. They will refer a family and the child to DDA for assessment of the child's eligibility for waiver services managed by DDA, for example, respite care. And they will assist with the transition of a young adult who's turning 18 who's received mixed services into the adult private duty nursing program. Nancy, would you like to talk about provider responsibility? Sure. The stakeholders and partners that we have, they are, uh, are uh, people that help us make the program successful. DSHS, Children's Administration, DDA, Healthcare Authority, that's us, managed care plans, service providers, families that's the clients, community organizations, and hospitals. Provider responsibilities. Uh, the hospitals, they have to determine if the apple health, that the child is, is eligible for apple health, and if they are not eligible, assist the family in applying. When established, fee-for-service submits complete DDA packet, managed care, they, we contact the, the enrollee plan. We assist with families in connecting with agencies to initiate the services. Private duty nursing agencies contact the BDA program manager or the child's managed care plan to confirm eligibility and approve and they approve hours. If required, coordinates with other PDN agencies to fulfill all authorized hours. Provide authorized hours and does and Doris has those all logged in to her her conception. Who do families contact for information and program support? If the child is enrolled in Apple Health as a for service client, they contact the Developmental Week Dis Disabilities Administration Nursing Services Unit, which is headed by Doris Barrett. We have here her email and her phone number. If the child is managed care enrollee, you contact the child's plan. For additional assistance in accessing mixed services, be for service or managed care, you may call the customer service center phone number that's listed here, and they will route your call as appropriate. Now we're going to turn it back over to Doris, and she'll talk about the adult private duty nursing. So when we talk about the adult PDN program in Washington State, this is also a state plan service, but it is managed by ALSA Home and Community Services. HCA does not share responsibility for this age group. In the adult program, in the adult PDN program, the client must be 18 years of age or older. Again, they must meet functional and financial criteria. Apple Health eligibility is determined. Remember, we are payer of last resort. And also, they will require the skilled nursing care of four continuous hours. With the settings that this can occur in is either in a private home or in a specialty adult family home. These rules are identified in the PDN WAC 388-106-1010 to 1045. This program is managed by HCS through the community nurse consultants who manage the long-term care clients. If this is a, an adult DDA client, then it is managed through our DDA case managers and our nurse care consultants. 
what are the individual's rights under the MICP and the Adult Private Duty Nursing Program under Medicaid? The Americans with Disability Act, ADA, give the adult or a child the right to receive Medicaid services in the least restrictive settings, such as a home or a community, and not in hospitals or institutions, if possible. The federal law requires state and Medicaid managed care plans, if applicable, to respond to requests for assistance arranging, either directly or through referrals, adult private duty nursing and medically intensive program, medically intensive children's services. These services must be provided timely. If services are not started timely, or all authorized services are not provided because unable to find nurses, families, parents, or guardians have the right to ask the state or the managed care plan to uh, help obtain these, this nursing. I have included a, on the slide the, the resources for the rules for the medically intensive children program and the adult PDN program. Gail, back to you. You may have families that ask you what legal resources may be available to them for assistance. If this is the case, then we provided this information for you in collaboration with the Northwest Justice Project, their telephone number as well as their online access. Thank you for your participation this morning, and we will now take questions. Yes, are there any questions? What would be an example of a broader service? Uh, if the question is related to what the managed care plans can do, um, I think the example I gave was long-term IV therapy. So they, if a child had um, TPM, um, some type of infusion therapy for which it made sense that a nurse be available to the child more than a short-term home health nurse would be needed to be available, then the, the plan could choose to invoke this benefit to serve that child's needs. Um, it's all very case specific, but it's, it's available to them. Does each plan offer the same ancillary service? If you're referring to this service, um, yes, I mean that's their, all plans have that opportunity. Does anyone in the room have any questions right now while I'm getting these other ones up? Questions from y'all? Uh, timely. Uh, the, the, one of the slides uh, addressed the need for provision of services in a timely manner. What would the HCA and uh, CSHS consider services to be timely? The definition of timely. So I believe that the way we look at timely is that you're actively, as a plan representative, that the plans are actively engaged in the discharge planning so that the discharge can occur timely. The child does not continue to be in a more restrictive setting, like the hospital, or a child's moving from the group home setting to the home setting. So there, there are two opportunities there, a transition from a more intense level of care and a, and a more restrictive setting to a, the less restrictive setting, which would, of course, always be the home, private home. Where can we get a copy of the presentation? If you have registered for the presentation, Venus will email it out to you. Is that not correct? Yes, she will email it out. So to be clear, Doris determines eligibility for the MIT program. I and E just complete the first completes the determination, correct? I and E determines the DDA eligibility, then through the application. The NCC does a review and makes recommendation. We work together and determine uh, what services or how many hours they're eligible for. All MIT applications go to DORS, correct? That is, to I and e. that, 
the MICP application comes to me, the DDA application for services go to INE. If there's a question in the room, can I take it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there things that um, the HCA and DSHS are doing or can do to help address the shortage of nurses working in this area? We were just, uh, just in July, we were able to secure funds to increase the reimbursement rate for nurses who provide the service in the home private home. It was our hope that that would um, be an incentive for hiring. We recognize that either there is a nursing shortage statewide and that it is difficult for the private duty nursing agencies to compete with other um, forums for which a nurse might choose to be employed. I look around the room and I know how many of us are nurses sitting in here. Um, and I think that a private duty nurse in a person's home is a very special person and takes a very special person. So our intent was to hope that our intent was to achieve to get that rate increase and hope that that would be incentive for nurses to shift to this form for delivering care. Other questions in the room while she's looking? Karen? I wonder if you might talk a little bit about um, augmenting um, existing plans of care that includes private duty nursing in the home for kids that might need additional resources. Well, my brain is flooding with a lot of ideas there, so could you be right. more specific? Like augmenting uh, with home health, uh, uh, intermittent home health visits. The conversation we had the other right. day. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I uh, Nancy and Doris and I threw this around the other day um, when we were working on this and actually trying to brainstorm um, possible solutions for the shortage, at least the access to a skilled care. And so, um, everyone has, every child has access to home health as well as the uh, services available through MIC. And the three of us came to the conclusion that one model might be in order to meet the need would be to have the MIC program and the home health program run um, parallel to deliver services to the child such that they may have a private duty nurse um, being paid under the MIC benefit, say, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and maybe on the weekend, for at least four hours, given that that's the requirement. Many times that's 8 to 16, but whatever it is, it's been identified and can be filled. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, that the possibility would be that they could have a home health aide and a home health nurse go in. The home health nurse going in to do a skilled assessment, uh, make sure the child's stable, not suffering from, from any decline or and things are, are running smoothly there, provide some support to the family as well. Um, it would be important that the home health nurse and the NIC nurse work closely together because, you again, you want, don't want to have confusing messages. You want to make sure everybody's on the same page in regards to the treatment plan. And then if the family needs assistance with personal care, such as bathing, um, passive range of motion, um, other services that fall into the realm of a home health aid, then the home health aid could also go in for approximately an hour um, on that day as well. So that's one of the options that we were also thinking about in regards to trying to meet the need and providing coverage for that family, making sure that there was um, sufficient access at least for assessment and some intervention um, over the course of a week. So. Exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A question about the process. The client does not determine DDA eligible until both the clinical and financial eligibility are verified. Is that still correct? 
Yes, that is correct. When you say DBA packet, is that DBA eligibility or MICP packet? In the packet, there's two forms. There is a DDA financial application, and then there is a mixed application. So it's composed of two pieces, as well as with the consent and the release of information. Question. Um, what about if a child is not PDA eligible? Can they still get nursing services through the fever service mix program? If the child is not mix eligible? DDA eligible. eligible. Will they be eligible for nursing services? Is that what you're asking, Colette? No, they will not be. PDN MICP is requested. How do we refer them? <coughs> okay, so I'm, I'm thinking that you're wanting to know what's the first step. Um, the first step should be to ascertain is the child in a plan and which plan or is the child in fee service covered by fee service. If they're covered by fee service, then you would follow the process that Doris provided and address during the webinar. And if they are covered by a plan, you would reach out to the plan, contact the plan, let them know what services you're looking to provide for the child and work at and now plan, they would probably assign a case manager or the person who is most knowledgeable about the program and the plan would work with you to receive that referral and work with the providers to move forward towards discharge. What is your definition of timely service? Is 90 days timely or who makes that decision of timely? The point is, is that it is supposed to be that the services are supposed to be provided in a way that the discharge is not impeded. But there is the reality of being able to find private duty nursing who will be able to, uh, and an agency that will be able to fill the hours. It's acknowledged that you cannot discharge a child home without coverage for hours if that child does indeed require private duty nursing. And, yet, and it's safe because that is what assures a safe plan of care. So, um, so it's, it's I think the, the way that we have to reconcile the shortage of nurses and the need to get the child discharged to the least restrictive setting as quickly as possible is that um, people are working towards that end and are engaged daily, working actively with private duty nursing agencies to find a resource to deliver the care. What is the case management role if there simply is not nursing to cover the amount of hours the client is assessed for? So I think that that segues into the next piece that the three of us will be working on, which um, Nancy and Doris and myself, in that we will be developing policies and procedures that will support the case managers to know how to escalate situations through appropriate channels so that cases for which there are hours are not available, the hours cannot be filled, um, we will have a process available for escalation where a decision can be made at a more executive level in regards to options for filling those hours. If adult PDN MICP is requested, how do we refer them to the HCA? The, if they would then still have to do financial eligibility. So if they're in the hospital, they would have the hospital discharge planner contact the HCS office to get the uh, application in process. Is a Medicaid application needed for an MICP client turning 18 and applying for adult PDN? Can you that again? Is a Medicaid application needed 
for an MICP client turning 18 and applying for adult PDN? Well, the child would already have, the individual would already have Medicaid, so a new application wouldn't be needed. They would just need to be, you would just need to assure that they have followed the agency's processes with recertification from year to year to maintain that eligibility. Doris, is there a uh, way to make sure that that transition from child to adult is a smooth transition? Yes, if, if this is a child, our nurse care consultants, our NCCs, do work with the HCS program manager to help with that transition. And they start making those, that, that discussion with the family six months, at least six months if not sooner to advise them of the transition that will be occurred. And then the nurses that are already in there, child, going to adult, are the nurses changed or do they stay? They generally stay. Uh, it, it depends. They have a broader access to nurses in the adult program and the fact that they can hire independent contracted nurses which is a benefit that only occurs in the adult program and not in the, chil in the children's program. So we do have independently contracted nurses for that, for those things. The client can't be determined until the DDA eligible until the MCC determines clinical eligibility. How does the DDA eligibility happen prior to the nurse's input? They have to first complete the DDA eligibility application. When, that, when, when they apply, they often at the hospital, they also are completing the MICP application. We look at both, but the final determination isn't made until after the NCC reviews the application packet. So they're parallel paths, Doris? They can be parallel paths, yes. What happens when no con contracted nursing agency can provide the need in-home skilled nursing? Well, I get a brief. Uh, yeah, I mean the bottom line is is that again we expect um, CDA, HCA expects CDA and the managed care plan to continue to seek the resource to fill those hours and come up with a plan that provides an opportunity for a safe discharge. That's why, I think that's why we're, we're trying to, to help uh, things out by incorporating the home health benefit in there somewhere because uh, nurses can go out to the home twice, twice a day if the need is there. So invariably with home health in there, it can at least help fill in some holes if the client really desperately needs something, maybe morning and evening, uh, a home health can fill in that hole until a, a full private duty nursing can be staffed. Do you have a list of certified PDN agencies per area to assist with finding additional agencies if the primary agency cannot fully staff the hours? We do have a list of the nursing care agencies and we can post them on our DDA uh, MICP website. So, Doris, you would provide it if the child was covered under fee for service, but we would expect you to contact the managed care plan and work with their case manager to identify what enrolled providers they have to serve the child. Back to broader services. Would the managed care plan help a homeless family secure housing if the child was eligible for PDN and homeless? Well, we actually have a case where a plan did that. So um, we look to the plans to be creative in solving the problems that are presenting themselves. Uh, we had one family that was homeless. They needed a bigger home. They needed a car. Uh, I believe they needed a bed for the furniture. child, furniture, and um, help with heating the home. Right, help with heating the home, and 
because the child had no destination for discharge. And so the plan worked with the family and, the, and their hospital provider, the social worker, to pull all that together once those problems were identified. And they resolved them effectively, and that child went to that home setting. Does a person need to be DDA eligible first in order to be MICP? Yes, they do. Please repeat about DDA eligibility. Repeat what? Yeah. What would you like repeated about DDA eligibility? Could you be more specific, please? I guess the one thing I would say, if this is where your question was in relationship to, uh, Karen Wilson and I have, and Colette Jones has been on point kind of for the managed care side of providing these services, implementing these um, systematic changes that we're implementing as a result of the settlement. And uh, we've recognized that there may be managed care enrolled children who weren't receiving services from DDA and that it may be a shortcoming that we hadn't provided them education about the benefits that are available as a DDA covered child. It was not our intent by moving children to managed care that children would have a tiered program or two different programs, that fee-for-service children would be the only ones that would receive DDA wraparound waiver services that might be available. And so what we have done is provided an in-service to the plans about um, the DDA services. We had DDA program representatives come and do approximately an hour in-service so that the plans case managers would be aware of the benefits that are provided through those waivers and how to access them so that all children could receive the benefits that are available through the waiver. Does that help? MICP is an eligibility category for DDA. So if someone is otherwise qualified for MICP, they may be able to qualify for DDA while they are receiving MICP. That is correct. Case management is to contact the insurance plan or family is to reach out and get the nursing. So is case management to contact the managed care plan or the family to reach out and get the nursing? Well, so let me answer this one. The case manager or the family should be able to contact the plan, tell them what their services are that they are needed, and I would expect the plan to work with the private duty nursing agencies to identify resources to fill that needed out. Is it true that normally, most most times, when this is instituted, the child is still in the hospital? Yes, most, most, most of the time. Most of the time. Is there cases where they're not in the hospital? Cases where they're in the group home and moving from the group home so, to the yeah. home, because that's a step-down kind of sort of situation. Okay. So then, it, it, if they're in a group home, then who is responsible for contacting the plan? Well, there are resources at the medically fragile group homes that would reach out to the appropriate payer. And they do that now. And that payer, that managed care plan, is more than likely already authorizing the RN hours at the medically fragile group home. So that shouldn't be a problem to link uh, the right people up. It's just, it's just working on that plan. Right. You know, you're, it's a discharge plan to the home being the ultimate, private home being the ultimate setting. Okay. So the managed care plans would already be engaged, as would yours. Mm -hmm. DDA, she knows who's there as well, and so she would be helping to assist for the nurses' folks. On the question of non-DDA eligible child, can this child access the next through DDA specialized unit as fee for service? Not that I'm aware of, no. If a person is on managed care plan and receiving nursing, does the NCC still need to review? No, the NCC is not um, 
these children under managed care are not under the purview of the nursing care control. The managed care plans fill that role. How are we currently handling situations where the client qualifies for CN but also has private insurance with a defined nursing limit? We we will cover those after they will have to exhaust the, the private insurance benefit first. Once the private insurance benefit has been exhausted, we need to have a letter of denial and then we will reassess them at that time. Would you fill hours that aren't filled? No. Yes, we will. <laughs> That's the criteria. Yeah. Yes. yes. And then can I answer for Go ahead. Care? Yeah. So, so it should in, be the same. Right. I was just going to say, ditto for the managed care children because in January of this year, right, we have moved um, children who have other coverage in, into the, enrolled them into managed care plans, and the managed care plan <coughs> would approach it the same way as Doris just described. So, so and the rest of the question, does the client automatically resume CM status once the nursing limit on the insurance is been reached? They are CN and status are regardless. Yeah. That doesn't change. So if you're enrolled in the CN program, you get all the benefits of a categorically needed program. Your status doesn't change. Can a family choose MPC if nursing is not available at nursing level of care? They have the right to choose. MPC is Medicaid personal care. Uh, yes, they have that right to make that that change if they so desire. What will be the option to escalate if they can't fill hours due to lack of nurses? At this point in time, if you can't fill hours and you don't, you're concerned that you don't have a sufficient level of engagement by DBA or a managed care plan, you are welcome to call the MAX, our customer service here at Medicaid. It's on their resource page. I believe it's page 24. Let me look to make sure. Yes. As it says in the third bullet down on page 24, for additional assistance in accessing mixed services for feature service or managed care enrollees, contact the Healthcare Authority's Medical Assistance Customer Service Center. The 1-800 number, those individuals in that unit have been given directions as to how to respond to that phone call. And I'll tell you that you'll either end up at my desk or Nancy's. Yep. And as the healthcare authority representative to this program, Nancy and I will will work with Doris. work with Doris, and I'll work with the plans, and uh, we will do the best we can to see how we can move that case forward. Who is the PDN program manager? Uh, the PDN, the private duty nursing for the adult program is Javorley Work, W-E-R-K. She manages, let me clarify, she manages the long-term care aging population, 18. Long-term care clients. I will also oversee the DDA uh, private duty nursing clients. Can a child be DDA eligible under developmentally delayed and then apply for MICP? Can you repeat that? Can a child be DDA eligible under Dell delay and then apply for MICP? Yes, they can. Client would be at home first, private insurance runs out, then applies for MICP. That is correct. Yes. But you want to apply earlier than just waiting for it to run out. Right. You don't want to have a gap in care, so you want to initiate that referral. Um, I to use the word timely, so that, <laughs> yeah. so that there's not a gap in service. Will you kindly have an FAQ document for today's webinar? Sure. Are we, we reserve the right to make our answers a little more complete. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sure that a person can't be eligible for MICP but not for DDA services? I feel like we have examples of this happening currently. So I assume you're talking about the deeper service side, so Doris. So, so repeat the question again. 
are we sure that a person can't be eligible for MICP but not for DBA services? Yes, there are instances that could be. So a person would submit a packet and even though the DBA eligibility wasn't established, you'd look at the need for nursing? We could look at it, but if they're not DDA eligible, they won't be eligible for services. That's what we just asked them. Oh, well, that's so the question is, is, is there an exception? Not that I'm aware of, Kathleen. I, or I think maybe the question is the eligibility for DDA. A client could be DDA eligible simply because they're MIT eligible. I, I think maybe that's what the question is. And then, of course, there's no yeah. DBA eligibility required for a for child who's in a managed care plan. They are an enrollee of the plan, and that is a benefit for which they are entitled. It's not tied to DBA eligibility. So maybe the, the child that you have a memory of was actually a managed care enrollee. If the client is DBA eligible at three, then terminated at four due to non-DBA criteria, does this affect MICP? Yes, it may affect it, yes. It affects the MICP under the Deeper Service Program. Cor correct, that's on state. It doesn't affect managed care. Does the client have to qualify for DDA if they are enrolled in a managed care plan? They do not have to apply for DDA to be eligible to receive the mixed benefit under the plan. But what we want to make sure is that any child who may be eligible for DDA wraparound services, there is a referral and the family is encouraged to pursue eligibility for DDA benefits for which they, so they can receive benefits from the <coughs> school programs. If a child has both CN and private insurance coverage and meets clinical eligibility requirements, can they be DDA eligible through MICP? Yes. People get MICP currently that are not DDA eligible. Well, the managed care. For sure if they're managed care, yeah. but I couldn't speak to any super service. So, so repeat the question, Lena. It's not really a question. It's, a it's more of a statement. People get MICP currently that are not DDA eligible. And now he's well, saying they're DDA eligible because of MICP. Yes. So they are getting DDA services because because they're MICP currently. Correct. So here's Jason's answering question. Saying, no, they are fee for service and being served by DBA. Okay. Are you waiting for me to respond? No. There are more no questions right this moment. I, for those attendees that are all in a room together, if you would please send me names, email addresses, and phone numbers at Venus, B E N U S dot Sanders at HCA.wa.gov. I need to um, put together an attendance list so that we can submit it. The group that this is mandatory training was attended. Okay, we have one more here. If the client is not eligible for DDA, could they still receive the MICP benefit through the managed care plan? Yes, a child. A child who is an enrollee of the managed care plan, the eligibility of that child for NIC services is not contingent on DBA eligibility. The benefit is in the plan and the plan is expected to provide that service with no tie to DBA eligibility. But that child may be eligible for DBA waiver services, be enrolled in that program, and we want those families referred for, to apply for DBA eligibility so that they can receive services from that program to which they are entitled. How will administrative question, okay, how will that refer to the managed care organization? They won't. They're going to call me. <laughs> and I'm going to call the plan. 
Uh, is it possible for the managed care plan to obtain a copy of the settlement agreement? I don't see why not. It's a public document. I'll provide it. Thank you. I'll just check to make sure that it's a public document. So I can't think of any rule that would exclude it. Right off the top of my head. Here. Can you comment on how, what is the role of the managed care plan in providing uh, transition services for children in the MIC program through the plan that are transitioning to the adult PDN benefit? Sure, and I guess that's one of those policies and procedures we're going to have to work on them with. Yeah. But I would hope that the policy and procedure would cover the fact that they early on identify that that child is going to have a birthday yep. and that the needs for that child are not going to change. They would, should have assessed any change though, um, maybe their reduction in hours, uh, maybe a change in service. I mean, things change from the time you are a newborn till the time you are 18 if you started with the service as a result of your birth. Um, and then they, I would think that they would reach out to, to myself um, or or Doris, yeah, mm -hmm. being our liaison to the, D, to the DDA program, and then she would help us connect with um, DSHS appropriate staff and help with that transition. And we, the plans would share information with the program manager so that we can have a smooth transition. And I would hope that DSHS staff would be timely in that response so that we could continue services. And they would follow their protocol, but we would need to make sure that it was done timely so that we could continue services without a gap. Does that help? Yep. Thank you. If you're fee for service, you must be DDA. But if you are in a managed care plan, you don't. Is that what you were saying? Yes. <laughs> Correct. Why, Joe, I think you've got it. <laughs> and I know that's kind of funky. I get it. But that's the way it is. Doris, could you um, go back to the question about Medicaid personal care and discuss how that service can support the needs of kids that need private duty nursing or are already being served with Nick? In if they are de if they are in fee for service, there is a care assessment done. That care assessment generates personal care hours. With those personal care hours, uh, we look first look to see how many Nick hours there are. And if there's any remaining hours, we can add some personal care support. There could be some respite services. Uh, so uh, we can offer some of those other benefits at that point. So that's one more reason why the plan should make sure children are referred to DDA. Exactly. Correct. Great. Do they have benefits that are not part of the managed care, care contract. Great. That would be another support for those kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else, Stephen? All right, this moment. Okay, we'll wait a few more minutes for last minute questions. Any questions here? Does managed care backfill nursing? Backfill? Backfill. Huh. I mean, managed care doesn't bill, so. Are they talking are you, about like a retro authorization? Yeah, are you? Retroactive pay for nursing. Yeah. Okay. Um, that would be a plan policy. Not sure why you would have begun services without involving the plan. I think it would be case specific as to what the circumstances around that might be, given that if a plan requires prior off, I would have expected that prior off process to have been done before the nursing began. If it's an issue where there was a primary care, a primary payer, and the child was in the new group that just went over, and they run out of hours with that uh, private duty benefit under their prime, then I think that's a case-specific situation that we may have to talk about. Okay. 
So I think it all depends, but I don't. My first um, position on that would be that if the plan requires prior off, then prior off would have been followed. I have always up to the provider to check eligibility on an ongoing and regular basis. Right. Is there ever going to be a time that a child has been in the hospital, let's say has a primary care, they apply for Medicaid, become fee for service, and are not assigned a managed care organization right away, and then somehow or other the prime does no more private duty, the child is still on fee for service, but then transitions to managed care within another few days, and they don't know. Well, you, you've made it very complex, Nancy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but this happens. So, I, so, so the point to understand is that with early enrollment, there are situations in which I, so, so understand it, in April of last year, we initiated early enrollment. The principles of early enrollment are that if managed care eligibility is established within that same month of application, managed care enrollment starts at the beginning of that month. So, so hopefully those applications are made timely, that enrollment is decided timely, and there is no deep service gap, as we refer to it here. Right. Okay? Right. So we would expect that's the scenario where I was saying that it's possible that with the prime with, and with the new program that we started, that it's possible as of January that there may be some children who are in that situation I just described a while ago. Right. And that would be a scenario in which I would work with the plan and ask them to retrospectively consider because they have other new policies that they've had to build that are retrospective in order to provide services under that expectation of early enrollment. I think if the situation is that you have a month gap where you have the late application and the, the, the Medicaid eligibility was established in like right now right. in the month of March, right. but the enrollment wasn't done in managed care until April, we, you and I and Doris would have to work together on what are we going to do. Yeah. Because and those are case specific situations that we'll have to work out here to identify mm -hmm. the eligible, um, the, the payer of responsibility and then figure out how to make sure there's no gap in care and that we make sure that all the pieces come together to make sure that that child receives the services and that we still honor the managed care enrollment rules. So I think that those are going to be case specific situations that we have to talk about when we bring the plan into those conversations. And those are going to be few and far between. Very, yes, because most, um, our data is showing that enrollments are happening rather quickly in managed care, and we're not having fee for service gaps. It's just moving really well. That program is moving really well. Can you clarify whether HCS is involved on the managed care side to transition children who are aging out of MICP to PDN services? Well, we would work through Doris. Yeah. She would be our gate into the DSHS world for that segue, and she would connect either with HCF or DDA, it would just be, depending on each child's needs. And it was just clarified that the question related to foster care. I, I don't see a difference. I don't either. It's still the same. We still need to have that gate through Doris. Doris is our conduit. <laughs> All roads lead to Doris. All roads lead to Doris. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's always Doris said. Oh, that's better than Gail talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have Gail's phone. Yeah, I have. Done right now. Right now? Well, there were some last minute questions. Other items? Other scenarios? Okay, we'll wait one more minute. <laughs> we really want to thank you all for calling in today. It's very important to the health care authority that we are compliant with the settlement provisions. As I spoke earlier, Nancy, Doris, and I are joined at the hip. 
We will continue to implement the provisions that we agreed to. Um, I believe the next thing we need to start working on are the policies and procedures. Um, we're working on the MOU that I described earlier. We will work on the Q&A to wrap this up. Just so you're aware, the reason that Venus is asking you for names of the attendees in rooms is because by settlement, we have to turn in the list of everyone who's received the training. This training will be available. Um, I'm not quite sure how. how? LMS is going to be pushing it out to staff. but. We will have the recording posted and we'll have access for it for the managed care organizations and the other agencies. Okay, yeah. you'll we'll send information out that to everybody? That will be. And the presentation will be sent out after uh, Monday. I'm not going to say it's going to be today because I'm sure there's going to be a lot. So uh, Monday, so, I'll make sure the presentation is out. Everybody who has attended. All right. So, so Venus will be working um, with other entities to make sure that they know how to access the webinar. Um, we're going to run it you know, through the month of April. The attendee sheet that I referred to a little few minutes ago is due to the plaintiff's attorneys at the end of the month of April. Uh, but we're going to just continue to run it. And um, um, if people attend um, after April, we'll just send them the, the sheet so the individuals who watched it to show that it's ongoing and that we complete the requirements. Um, so I hope that today provided some clarity on the MIC program and that there is no difference in the program other than the issue around DDA eligibility as a requirement for receiving services, okay. that basically the benefit is pretty much the same um, as it's managed by the plants and DDA. Correct that all children are entitled to receive this service, whether it be through the fee-for-service pay uh, provider one with, with BDA administering it, or whether it be through a plan and the plan paying for it. Um, it's very important to us that the children receive the services with the, with the caveat that acknowledging that there's a nursing shortage and it's very difficult to fill the hours. It is our intent to get those hours filled, and maybe we can come up with some more creative ways um, to help fill those hours. So if any of you have suggestions on that, we would also be appreciative of you sharing that, because um, it is something we struggle with here every day. And we, we really appreciate um, the service that you all provide to these children. One last question, and then we're going to be ending. Do you have a number for the managed care to call and help coordinate service for lack of nursing? You should contact the plan directly, but if you're still having difficulties, you're welcome to call the MAX line number. And I'll give you the number. It's 1-800-562-3022. And those individuals um, who answer the phone, I believe, will take down your name and number, and I'll get an email, and I will call you back, and I, you can brief me on the situation as you see it, and then Karen and I will work with the plan. And, and just so you know, this Karen and I have been working with the plan for over a year on these cases, especially the children who were in the lawsuit. Um, there were five, and now there's three. One child unfortunately expired, and um, the other child's parents moved to California. So there are only three right now. Um, one is fee for service, and two are managed care. And Doris and I um, work closely on the fee for service child and the nursing care consultant, and then Karen and I work with the plans on the two other children. But all children, it's our responsibility to make sure all children receive that type of oversight. Okay, but it, yeah. All right, we're going to sign off. Thank you all again. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>